Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you also need to be careful with your computer's defense as well. If you need a VPN, go Nord. NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber to get a two year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber. Name and job title, please. Uh, Kumar Sangakara, retired international cricketer, uh, currently uh, director of uh, cricket and uh, head coach of Rajasthan Royals in the IPL and founder of Meta11. Tell me about Meta11. I, I, did I say that right? Meta11? Is that how it's supposed to be like all together? Yeah, Meta11. Um, uh, it's uh, an exercise among friends to really try and bring um, um, cricket into the metaverse in terms of uh customizable uh, owned avatars that play in uh, bespoke uh, uh, and and created um, stadia um, digitally uh, and to tr- kind of democratize access so that anyone who loves cricket and we know there are so many of us out there uh, can play against each other play as communities play as friends and really earn uh, earn rewards um, in, in, in terms of, of, of engaging and, and being able to create uh, cricketers that they, that they, can, um, like they can watch and, uh, and own. So it's, it's quite an exciting project and uh, we've been developing it for a couple of years and uh, we're progressing quite well. And so is it like a combination of fantasy cricket and like a video game sort of, but in the metaverse? Yes, it is. And also kind of football manager. Uh, it's AI driven. So the avatars will learn as well. You actually don't play uh, uh, for the avatar. The avatars just play. They learn as they they go along. Each, each avatar is an all-rounder. Uh, and the games are, are very, very short between uh, two and four minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you can play one, uh, you know, one v one or, or, or a, a smaller team against a, a smaller team. So uh, the possibilities are quite exciting. Uh, just have you played, and are you any good? Uh, well, I think I had. Uh, I, I was uh, all kind of geared up with all these sensors, and I was uh, one of the avatars that can be dropped in and. So uh, anyone can uh, actually be be kind of drop their own stats in. Uh, you can create avatars out of out of out of all the data that we've been collecting as well. Um, so it's it's quite exciting. I I'm, I'm not really sure how good I was, but because it's so short and my T20 record is not that good, I, I think it's pretty <laughs> obvious that I won't be uh, much good at it. I love the idea of you playing the game with the avatar of you and then getting frustrated at your, yourself for not scoring quick enough. Um, it, oh, well, it full, comes full circle, doesn't it? it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the whole point. And being able to kind of understand the frustrations that coaches, players, spectators go through all in one <laughs> when you are actually in the game is, is very, very interesting. Oh, beautiful. Well, good luck with it all. Um, I know you've Thank already you. raised a lot of money and it's, it's going quite well at the moment. So uh, hopefully it keeps going in the right direction. Hope so. Uh, I want to go back a little bit now. Uh, I've got you on this podcast because I'm doing a project on the best batters of all time. And believe it or not, you, you, you're you involved in this book, even if before we spoke, because uh, <laughs> we, we talk about your batting quite a bit. What do you think it is about your batting that, you know, that worked so spectacularly compared to other players because you're obviously a very talented player, but you, you played alongside, you know, guys like Mahela and, you know, and, and other players, but people don't end up with the average of, you know, of Kumar Sangakara. So what was it specifically, do you think that made um, batting work better for you than someone else? Well, I, I think it's, it's testament to the beauty of this game where, you know, everyone's talented, to a certain degree, um, I wouldn't consider myself a special talent. I think I'll reserve that for the likes of Javad and Aravinda De Silva and Sanat Jaisuria in our side, the likes of TM Dilshan as well. I was more workmanlike and I had to find a, a, a really effective method that worked. I grew up in a very technical environment with all the coaches in Sri Lanka. It was always by the book. My father was uh, my first and last or major coach, and he was also extremely technical. And for him, it was never about runs. It was always about the way I batted. Um, 
And there would be times when I scored 100 and he'd say, well, that was awful. Or I'd score 15 and he said, that's the best you've ever batted. So uh, it was always a case of being you know, driven to, to reach a, a stage of technical excellence, which I, I don't think always works because uh, what I found out throughout my career is that technique has to be effective in delivering performance and, and quantifiable performance because talent and potential without an output, a measurable output is just talent and potential. Um, so... Um, I went through quite a few stages in my career coming in, I think, into the national side uh, much sooner than I probably should have been allowed in because I don't think I'd even scored a first-class 100 when I made my debuts. Uh, and then trying to figure out a method by not by, by, you know, by virtue of just arriving doesn't mean you've made it. You've got to stay there. You've got to cement your, your place and then continue to grow. Um, and I experimented a lot in terms of my technique and my batting. I changed my grip. I, Aravinda De Silva was the first who, who really spoke to me about changing my grip and, and learning how to watch the ball. So I wasn't just a kind of a hacker square of the wicket, but I could also play straight and, and develop an onside game a lot, a, a lot better. Um, uh, and then I went through stages where I changed almost every fundamental I was taught never to change. Um, and I think that was one of the things that really helped me because I had the knack of being able to change my grip, my stance, my tap, my trigger movements, uh, my the, the the height of my stance, all of these throughout careers, depending on conditions, depending on how I was feeling, um, to really be able to get through get through the, the, the tough periods of innings until I got my flow. Um, I also kind of understood what, what timing really meant, and timing to me is always being in sync. So it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, and I hate this kind of positive reinforcements about, you know, think about your last best innings, which is, to me, I found to be nonsense because they're all gone. You can't recreate the past. And, and I, I spent a lot of time trying um, with, with no real outcome. Uh, because every day is different, even if you're coming off uh, or, or in, in a purple patch. It, it's really about understanding the dynamics of the day and allowing your body the time to really fall into sync with what's happening on the day. The same pitch, the same bowlers, uh, the same environment, everything. But there are always nuances and subtleties that change. You could have slept a little bit too long. The bowler might have been better rhythm. The pitch would have deteriorated or changed. Um, in England, you know, overcast conditions suddenly do strange things to the ball. So, you know, I, I, I allowed myself the time rather than fighting to recreate the past to understand, okay, well, this is it today. How do I now get through the tough times and how do I end up scoring runs? Um, the other thing I, I kind of realized was also that, you know, you spend way too much time trying not to get out rather than accepting the fact that that's inevitable. But what are you going to do until, you know, by the time that delivery comes along or, or you make a mistake because, you know, all of us are, are humans. Or even if you don't make a mistake, a perfect shot could still get you out in cricket. So uh, I actually started putting a lot more value on run scored and being effective um, and understanding, um, you know, how to change that up in an innings. So I would have periods where I would buckle down. I had periods where I would take a lot more risks. I had periods of acceleration throughout my innings. So there was quite a lot of um, a lot of you know moving parts and quite a lot of things that go into batting from a personal perspective. But if I were to recap it, one is I started to understand myself a lot better, and that really helped me plan out my training and how I reacted to challenges and how I went about answering the questions that were being asked of of me, not just by myself but also by the opposition. Uh, number two was a mindset that was really open to change, uh, knowing that change is absolutely inevitable and is a must as long as you change with a plan and with a view to improvement. Uh, number three, back to score runs. Um, and, and, and finally, don't try to protect uh, the, the, the reputation or a legacy or kind of uh, a career. You just have to be open that every day is a new day and you're batting anew. Um, and those are the kinds of things, along with, of course, shot repertoire and everything that really helped me um, kind of score the runs I did. It's really interesting because you described the other players in your team as being more talented. But what you were talking about there is that, and, and you know, I've spoken to quite a few experts now about, uh, you know, former players and batters and bowlers. And they, they talk about there are a lot of the great batters just see the ball earlier or in, let's say Matthew Hayden, he has a huge forward step and a lot of power, or th they have some sort of 
supernatural skill, which means that their game kind of works everywhere so they don't have to change. What you're talking about is you're a different batter kind of, even in one innings from the morning to the afternoon, like you're constantly tweaking your game. Is, do you think that is something that you learnt or do you think that is something within you as, as a person? I think for me it was necessity. I, I, I just realised that I couldn't just bat the same way and expect the same results because the game moves forward, the opposition plans against you, all the strategy that they bring in is to try and challenge you to make a mistake or bowl at you in manners that make you uncomfortable. So if I try and stay static, I can get away with it for quite a long period. Like you said, depending on whether I see the ball early, reflexes, just experience, just having a really uh, settled method, all of that. But there comes a stage in everyone's career and usually it's towards the latter part where you just frustrate yourself trying to do the same thing. Um, uh, whereas other sides and bowlers have moved on uh, to, to do different things to you that you don't seem to have a proper answer for. So, uh, there were times when I was really settled and would bat long periods of time the same way. But then when I realized that it, I needed to change, I was quick to do it. I mean, I had lots of conversations in the dressing room with Mahela Javardana and Tilan Samravira when they were playing with me. And a lot of the time they would be like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you changing this? You're batting well. And in my mind, it was just a case of, of, of trying to see if is there anything that I can do better. Um, at the same time, if you're going through kind of a difficult period, even if to change a little thing and to take your focus away from, you know, kind of wallowing in, oh, I didn't score runs, or I'm having a bad patch or something, just something tweaking to get your mind off that to focus of, okay, I'll work on something, uh, is something different to kind of, you know, inspire me uh, or take my mind off. So, you know, I, I kind of get back into the rhythm of things. Those are Those are things that I, I kind of had in terms of, little mechanisms that I tried um, men to, to try and score runs. I want to talk about a period of batting when I think you were at your absolute best. You may not agree, but kind of that period from the 2015 World Cup when you made all those hundreds, I was lucky enough to cover a couple of those, to when you were making runs at Surrey, you know, in, in that period uh, towards the end. That sort of shows me that you're, like, rather than just being – a naturally gifted player. You're a player who was still tweaking things right until the end um, and getting it right. Is that your best period? And is that just the accumulation of knowledge, of experience, and your physicality still allowing you to do the things that you want to do all coming together? Or was it something else, do you think? Yeah, I, I think it was all of that. And I still liked playing. I still loved batting. Uh, I think I was very much ready to to be away from the international stage. I, I knew that my international career was done. I was very, very settled and happy uh, in walking away from it. And then Sare gave me kind of that nice cooling off period to, to you know, exercise any demons that I may have left over from, you know, about, you know, not trying to finish cold turkey. And in terms of county cricket, what I really understood, Jared, was that there is a, a very repeatable method, an easy method that you can settle on to score runs. Uh, you know, uh, short and wide, uh, throw your bat at it, uh, defend straight, uh, and as soon as spin comes on, take it down for as many runs and as quickly as possible. Um, and it and it just worked for for three seasons for me for me at Surrey. Uh, I also had uh, a, a period, um, you know, when I was scoring in Australia against England, just coming back uh, a few runs before that, and again, 2012, 13, 14. 15 when I really changed or 2011 onwards when I changed my attitude towards one day batting with my, the change in my role and, and mindset and also with some changes to the playing conditions in terms of field restrictions. So there were various periods of time I can I can go back and say, well, that was a really interesting period for me. Uh, but in terms of finishing off my career, I was still tweaking uh, things, as you said. Um, and it was, again, mainly because I knew I had to, to, to score runs. Um, you can talk about a settled technique and never changing, but what happens with age when you know your reflexes might slow down or certain things change, you put on a bit of weight, um, if, if your physical abilities change, what do you do then? Do you try and just battle on and, and, and really be attritional about never changing or do you just say, well, actually, I have to change? So I always think it's better to anticipate it and change a bit sooner rather than being forced to change when your back's against the wall. So uh, that period I really enjoyed with Surrey. I had a lot of freedom. Uh, I loved that dressing room. I loved the structure at Surrey. And you can see how good it is by the amount of 
England cricketers they're now producing uh, time after time and really good ones. So I had a great time and that really helped me to play better cricket. Every uh, there's a few different sort of categories that we can put bat- the great batters into. So you know, someone like Boycott didn't like to get out, and you know, Shivnor and Chandra is probably another one, right? And you got other players who love to score runs. There are entertainers. Uh, everyone's kind of has these different ones. I don't know where you fit in to 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 this. You're not as you know, Mahela. I was sort of Mahela as even though he was fighting for everything. He loved to be stylish. He loved to play that beautiful inside-out cover drive off the left arm finger spinner and show he could do it. Where do you fit in? Do you think? Are, are you? I mean, you you said technician before, but there has to be a reason you wanted to be that good in the first place. I, I I'm, I'm I'm very competitive. Um, I also had, I don't know, perhaps it's an environment I grew up in as well that I had. Uh, I don't know. I, I could put cricket in perspective. I, I knew it wasn't going to be the end and the end all and be all of my life. But for as long as I was playing it, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to, I wanted to to be recognized as being one of the greats. So when I started I had this idea of 20 hundreds, 20 hundreds. Uh, that's that that's that's actually the the, the 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 lower limit of being able to say, okay, you were good. And then I thought, okay, let's get to 25, let's get to 30. So I was just pushing myself continuously to, to score more runs, score more hundreds, uh, and 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 leave something of myself that that's to be recognized. Um, uh, and I, I could also switch off at the end of the day and do absolutely completely different things and never think about the game on on, on that day. Um, so I had I had quite a you know good support structure as well, Jared, uh, family and friends, a lot of whom had never really watched the game or weren't too enamored with cricket. So that really helped me. Mm. But I'm not sh- really sure whether I fit into to any of these categories or whether I would you know, want to, as long as, you know, like this interview in itself, you're talking to me because you feel that, you know, there was something valuable there in maybe for your book or whatever it is to understand, you know, how I did these things. So that's a, that's a confirmation in a way of, of, of doing something right, in, in, in my view. Uh, but... I've had a lot of people who, you know, you don't do these things alone. And, you know, I speak mm-hmm. to my father. It, for him, it was all about technique. I had another coach, Mr. Sunil Fernando, who was coaching me since I was about 13, 14. And for him, it was just about batting well and scoring runs. And he would never change anything that was working. So he would look at me and he would know my technique inside out, as my father did. But he wouldn't say, he would say, okay, that's working. It might not be exactly by the book. But that's what cricket's about. You've got to be able to adapt and 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 create your own method. Um, so um, I, I I really don't know. I don't have a, a perfect answer. If if you were to say, who would I have liked to have batted like? Uh, then there are so many around the world. But I would say Brian Lara, Arvind De Silva. Those two stand out as just absolutely top notch for me. I always have Arvind in my top five batters I've ever watched. In my entire life, uh, batting even now, I think he can outbat uh, anyone, uh, like outbat me any day in in the nets. Um, he was he was just supremely special, uh, and so was so was Lara, and so was of course Mahela's, Tendulkar's, Dravid, Sevags, Haydens, Pontings, Kalisas, all of these, uh, the Pollocks, Barry Richards. Uh, I met Barry uh, a few weeks ago in South Africa as well. So they they're all amazing, but you know there were two people. You know that I really wanted to. If if you ask me, yeah, Arvind and 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 and, and Brian, uh, that's that's who I would like to bat like. Maybe Sir Vivian Richards as well. A little bit, <laughs> have the swagger and that and that kind of you know kind of presence that mm. that Sir Viv brings to to anything. Even now, when he walks into a room, everyone just quietens down and just looks at Viv walking through. You know, he's he's that kind of uh, personality. Was one last question about your career that I've always been interested in. You and Clyde Walcott both started as wicket keepers, and you both average around forty, which is huge for a wicket keeper. Less so in your era, but certainly in in Clyde's era. But you take forty from any wicket keeper at any point. You both give up the gloves, and then you both average about sixty after that point. Your, your averages go through. How much of that is when you when you keep at test test matches, especially for, for yourself, you're up at the stump scrambling behind Murali and you, you know these guys, you know over and over again. So how much of it is it just gets tiring towards the back end of the match? How much also is the average was just lower because you 
as you said before, you were learning cricket when you first came in. You weren't a fully, you know, you, you, wasn't, you, you weren't someone who'd made 10 first class hundreds and came in on the back of that. They threw you in early on. So I've always wondered, does wicket keep, did you feel wicket keeping did hold you back as a batter or was it just maybe you were de still developing as a batter at that point? I really can't answer that question in one day cricket in T20 because keeping was a must. Uh, test cricket, it really helped me get in the side. Even in one day cricket, it helped me get in the side, number one. So I love I love the fact that we could keeping open the doors because I could keep and bat. Uh, in test cricket, it all depends on where you bat. Uh, I'm not sure where Clyde Walcott batted in what position, but uh, I batted at, at started at five but moved up very quickly in my first in my third test match in my first series to number three. And that is physically challenging, even as a 22-year-old, going through keeping in the heat, keeping in overseas conditions, whatever, it, it really saps energy, both mentally and physically. So when I do go into bat, a fall of an early wicket, um, which happened quite often you know, during certain years, no matter how much I was enthused to go out and play well and really wanted to do well, there are certain things my body just wouldn't do. Uh, Oh, I'd be I'd be quite lazy in, in in doing things that I know I shouldn't have done, or not planning properly, or not kind of reacting to things properly. So that came about. So when the selectors actually wanted me to give up my gloves, I was quite adamant that I shouldn't because I I knew it was a it was kind of an insurance policy for me to stay in the side if I were doing badly in my batting, if I keeping well, you know. So I wasn't really happy that I was asked to, but what it forced me to do was take a new look at my batting and said, all right, if this is all I have, now I've got to, I've got to be really, really good at this. Um, and, and, and I understood that when we did travel overseas, I would still have to take the gloves at certain times in England, uh, in South Africa, uh, just to ensure that we balance the side out and we could play that extra full batter in the side and allow for the same bowling attack to come in. Um, uh, so I, there were many times after that you know, as well that I had to take the gloves on at certain times, but I still had to had to bat three. So there were times when I when I when I did that out of necessity after really being told to give the gloves up. In one day cricket and T twenty, um, I just love keeping. I love being behind it. I think it was physically very taxing, but I think it really helped my batting as well because I had a first hand idea of how pitchers behaved and what was happening on it, and could really. And with my keeping skills improving, uh, I could do a, a really good job behind it and in front. And again, it allowed us the freedom to play a f a, another player mm -hmm. in the side without you know having someone just take up the gloves for the sake of it. So, um, so that was that was um, a hard question to answer. But Test cricket definitely it helped my batting with that fatigue and the position I batted. I mean, you look at Adam Gilchrist and um, and 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 Josh Butler two examples. I mean, Gilly was was fantastic in everything he did, but it doesn't the number you bat at in terms of Gilly and Josh doesn't really give you the opportunity to build long careers of huge runs. What it gives you is the ability to win games, and, and that's a very and a very break, right? Like it's the break, a break that you need and a break. But the nature of your game changes the moment you bat there. I mean, um, uh, Josh to me was an exceptional, exceptional cricketer. Um, uh, you know, batting at the six seven, um, I just wish he 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 just kind of put put the thought of batting properly or technically aside and just embrace the role of having to win games. And he would have probably won many more games than he he ended up winning for England. Um, um, and uh, and Gilly was just exceptional in that role of of batting with the last kind of recognised batter and then absolutely putting to sword a bowling attack when he was batting with with the tail. So, you know, your, the nature of your game changes, but the fact that I gave up my gloves and batted at three allowed me to to score a bigger volume of runs. Uh, Walcott also batted in the top... Well, he opened, batted three, four, and five, so it's probably a similar thing. He also had back in, uh, issues uh, wicket-keeping, so he had to give the gloves up eventually. But I, I just, it, It's an interesting one uh, when you look at it because, as you said... You're probably in the side earlier because you're a wicket keeper, which is also why your average was a little bit lower because you weren't quite ready to be at that level. So I think that makes sense. Let I want to get you on a bunch of batters. Um, let's just start with Aravinda de Silva because I, I mean he's one of my favourite uh, players of all time. He doesn't have the kind of average 
that puts him into some of the class of some of the guys that we'll be talking about in a moment. But for people like you and I, we saw him and we understand the, the, the genius of, of it. What was it about Aravinda de Silva that you thought made him so special? I think it's, uh, he and Brian were very similar in, in personality. They needed to be really inspired and motivated to give their best. And being in a group of highly talented cricketers, but him being the only kind of genius, until, of course, the Muralis and the Vasis came along and, and, and Sanat at a later stage as well. Or Sanat and then Murali and Vasis, mm -hmm. Sanat came before them. Um, and until he went to Kent, I think, in the mid-90s, uh, he didn't really understand what it meant to be consistently good or great. I mean, I think he, there were times when he was just bored or he wasn't really motivated within the inside uh, because he, he, he loves to win. He's a great cricket brain. He has a great understanding of, of, the, of his game as well. Uh, when I played the side, we were very determined to do well everywhere we went, not just at home. We wanted to win away. We wanted to keep winning World Cups like we did in, in 96. I think if Aravind had started in a side that had so much motivation and so much kind of pushing and, and, and challenging each other to get better, he would have scored, you know, 40 plus hundreds, you know, scored 13, 14,000 runs as well. But I think at that time when he played, it was kind of easy being you know the, the, the he, genius he was in, the star in, that in the smaller pond wasn't he yes yeah. and you know i i remember when i started playing at ncc in the late 90s 97 uh, aravinda was part of ncc and after 1999 he, he got dropped after the world cup um, quite unfairly i think um, um and he would come and play club cricket and there were days when he would call up and say, what time's the game starting? We'd say it's starting at 9.30. He said, okay, I'll be there by 10.30. If you're batting, put in a, or if you're fielding, put in a reserve until I come in. And if you're batting, I'll turn up and if a wicket falls, I'll walk in. Um, if you're fielding, he'll come in straight from the car park onto the ground in his whites uh, with his you know, sneakers undone. He'd come and stand at first slip, call out to the coach saying, I haven't eaten breakfast today. Send me to two pastries. And he put one pastry in his pocket, munched the other at first slip, and just stay there. And then if a catch came towards him, he'd step aside, look at the second slip, and go, how old are you? And they'd all be in their you know, early 20s. Said, oh, that's your job to dive and catch it. Um, he'd then go out to bat, and the opposition usually would put their worst ball on, like all their part-timers. And you could see Aravinda's eyes just glaze over. And he'd be like, oh, what am I doing here? And he'd step out, get out, hit the ball up in there, do whatever, come back and say, what number is Hashan Tilgaratna batting? And we'd go, he's batting number five or six. He'd say, oh, he won't get out till tomorrow. I'm going home. Call me if you need me. Uh, and off he went. But then there were other days when he had something to prove and he was trying to get back into that side because he, he, he was really hurt that he was left out. He'd be there before all of us. He'd feel that short leg, leg slip. He'd bowl better than any off spinner other than Murley. And then when he went out to bat and the opposition made the mistake of of putting on one of their best balls or bouncing him a couple of times or making some remark at him, he will score 150 to a 200 in the blink of an eye. And you'd be like, you know, that's genius. And it was the same after he went to Kent. I think Mark Benson said that when it was cold, Aravinda was miserable and in about four jumpers, not scoring a run. And he thought they made the biggest mistake in signing him for, for Kent. He said the sun came out, his demeanor improved, he actually started enjoying it, and he said he's never seen another overseas player bat like Aravinda did in the English summer. Uh, I, I remember he became man of the match in a losing course, I think maybe against Lancashire, but like Savazi Makram, everyone bowling, scoring 100 in a losing course. And he brought that, suddenly he realized how, you know, oh gosh, I've been an overseas player, a professional, I, you know, this is my responsibility, he came back. 95, 96, 97, 98, he was just incredible. And then when he came back into the side in 2000, 2001, I remember him telling me, he said, you know, if I wasn't left out the way I was, I would have scored another 20 hundreds with one eye closed. And I believe him <laughs> because I know that when he's motivated and inspired, he will do that. So that was the level of, of, of Aravinda De Silva's genius. Unfortunate that it was at a time when 
we probably didn't put as much into into terms of of like being the best until that 95 96 period and after that he was a completely different well he had a pretty handy 1996 world cup um so he, he, with bat and ball by the end um Let's go through some of the other players. That you, I mean, obviously, the one that you played the most with is Mahela. Mahela is someone who I think he averages 35 outside of Asia and 55 or something inside of Asia. He would almost be one of the greatest specialist batters that we've ever had. Um, and, you know, having watched him and even talked to him about how he plays spin bowling, he kind of feels like, to me, he sees it on a different level than, than everyone else does. What was it like batting with him? And what, what do you think made him different? Oh, he's... He was just absolutely gifted. Again, on the levels of Aravinda de Silva in terms of being gifted. Uh, he had just this lazy elegance, plenty of time. Technically, extremely correct. Even with his back lift, you'll see that it's not an open back lift. It's a very close back lift and going back straight. And if you watch him and how his front shoulder and head works all the time, you always see that, okay, if you have that back so straight, it's really difficult to be good on the short ball or or good on the legs, but because of that easy movement of the front shoulder, how early he saw the ball, it just, his complete game was was incredible. Um, against pace or spin, when he was on his game, uh, you know, it's incredible. It's very difficult to top him. So he he would, you know, spin was, for him, it was wrist. It was hitting against the spin, hitting over extra cover. Again, he was a batter who always looked to impose himself on the game, very much like Aravinda, like a Brian Lara, uh, like a Ponting um, or, or Hayden, um, a Sevag, you know, differently done, but the same attitude. I want to be on top of these bowlers and I'm going to stay on top for as long as possible. I'm going to take risks to do that. And if I get up, so be it. Um, and it, it was amazing to watch. I really love batting with him uh, in the same way I did with, with like a Dilshan because you have times where, you know, you take the lead in terms of being aggressive, then you take a back seat. You watch these guys put the bowlers, you know, to all to, to all parts of the field. Then, you know, you, you kind of so and we kind of knew each other's batting really well. So we we kind of fed off each other really well. Uh and that was that was that was really great to watch. Um at the start of his career, he he, he batted very little at training. I was the opposite. But at the back end of the innings, he had to do that change because of, you know, changes, as you say, you know, reflexes, all of that, like all of us went through. And he practiced a lot more. But, uh, you know, he, he's also in that category of genius in terms of, of batting, making batting look so easy in any condition. Uh, he also had, you know, huge peaks and troughs, as as many of these, you know, great batters will have. Uh, consistency is not something that they're really worried about. It's about being the best on the day. Uh, and yeah, he was he was he was supremely gifted and, and amazing to bat with. What did you learn from his batting? Oh, just the value of runs. Uh, I mean, how easy it is to postpone being dismissed when you're scoring runs and you're constantly putting pressure on the bowler, um, and being able to 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 have a better relationship with risk in order to you know understand the rewards that come with that. Um, so they were they were they were great to to bat with him and talk to him about cricket. Um, also, in our days, we had different roles. You know, when I started at number three in one day cricket, my role was to bat forty five overs. Let everyone else bat around it. Same for Marvin when he batted, um, and that and that was really nice that we had so many different players that could do different roles. Uh, but but for players like Mahila, for players like Dilshan, for Sana, it was just about you be the genius because they could. Uh, and we'll do the supporting roles. And, and and Sri Lanka was so good for so many years as a result of the diversity of players who could do so many different roles. Um, but yeah, but you know, very few players become. You, know, you can be great players or whatever, but there is a you know that touch of genius. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer, and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim that I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit, this is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. 
and I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore. Even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. Uh, you, you mentioned this player before, um, Samara Wira. He doesn't get as much uh, credit these days. Um, I think you, you and you and Mahela stole all, all the uh, the limelight in Sri Lanka, and he doesn't get remembered. But he he was impossible to get out on his best day. Another incredible player. What what do you think made his batting special? I think he was a little bit like me. Worked hard, brilliant against spin, and then he found a method against pace. He was very, very strong mentally. He was always the kind of player easiest to drop in terms of a batting lineup. He knew that, and then that made him a lot more determined. I remember his debut. He scored almost a runner ball 100 against India on a turning pitch at the SEC. And he was, along with the likes of Hashan Tilakaratna, you know, you know they'll score the runs for you. Um, in spin, he was really great with his wrists, great driving down the ground, hitting against the spin, which I always think hallmarks of great players of spin always have that ability to hit against the spin. Um, and Tilan Samaravira was just that. I mean, he started off as an off-spinner and de developed into one of the best test match players that we ever had and also a very, very handy one-day player. So um, for him, it was about determination, really buckling down and being able to absorb pressure. Um, yeah, he, he was very different to Ma uh, Mahela or Aravinda, but as effective. Just on all of you, really, including Aravinda, you know, I think goal is probably the wicket that spins the most in, in, in the world. If I remember the Prickfist data from the last time I checked it, Sri Lanka is generally the place where you have the least amount of seam bowled in test cricket, but also in first class cricket. How hard is it to be a young Sri Lankan batter and you're smashing the spinners everywhere and you're used to the ball ragging sideways and, you know, Glenn McGrath almost knocks your head off and, you know, Shoah Bakhtar is bowling, you know, at 90 miles an hour. Like, there's no way you can instantly be good at that, right? That it's spin come playing spin must come so, so naturally to so many of you guys, but playing pace must just take a lot longer. Yeah, I think Aravinda was was a very different to the rest. He just had this ability to hit whether you bowled 120 or 150, it didn't matter. If you bowled short, it disappeared. And he had a lot of time and ability to do it. He also he made runs in New Zealand when he was quite young on green pitches. I remember yeah, that. He scored, it, it, he scored a double hundred, and I watched that. Uh, I think Martin, Martin Crow scored 299 as well in that inning, in that match. Um, Aravinda just put Danny Morris into the sword. He was pulling him off a good length. Uh, that was, he was that good on the short ball. Uh, and he also never really wore a visor early on, so he had to watch the ball really well. And he always told me that he used his gloves and his bat as a second line of defense in front of his face, and that's how he learned to watch the ball so well. Um, I grew up in Kandy, where the weather is quite damp and rained a lot. And I played at Asgiria. The wickets were all the pitches were always green, always seemed always bit bit more bounce as well. A in lot Kandy, more bounce it? when I was there. Yeah. We had a. a a director of cricket at, at my school who spent a lot of time in England, so the pitches were always green. Um, he actually gave a, 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 a test pitch. Um, I think it was Vasi's uh, debut against Pakistan in Kandy. I was still in school, I think, or I just well, I remember watching it. The pitch was so green, and against Waka and Vasi, the last thing you needed. I think the match was over in two and a half days, um, and they just ran through us. Um, so that helped me to understand how to play pace better. But one thing we did change after 1999-2000 was the way we trained. Um, early, it was very easy. You know, there's this great story about Ravindra Pushpakumara running in and, and bouncing Sanat Jayasura. And Ravindra Pushpakumara ball a bit like Waka units, had an extraordinary long run-up like Shoaib, uh, a little bit slingy, quick. And he had come into training one day and he had been bouncing Sanat Jayasura and making Sanat very uncomfortable, late 90s, I would say. And someone had said, what the hell are you doing, man? You're bouncing the next captain of the country. Do you want to be in this team or not? You know. And they said, oh, oh, oh shoot, okay, fine, I'll pitch it up. But I think after, after 2000, we had no restrictions in terms of, you know, bowlers bowling to us in the nets. If we wanted to be the best, we had to be challenged in the nets. So with Dav Watmore coming back for his second stint, uh, John Dyson coming in, uh, captaincy changes to Sanath and then Marv and Hashan uh, Mahela. We just ensured that every practice was as challenging as it possibly could be 
with a look to performing outside the country. New balls, bowlers overstepping, even when the side arms came in. You know, don't take throwdowns for the sake of it. Make sure that you're being challenged. So the practice intensity changed and our work ethic changed to a massive amount of learning how to play the short ball. We knew we'd get bounced when we went abroad. So we'd have wet tennis balls. Uh, we had tennis rackets. We had all of these coming in, Tom Moody, Trevor Penny. They did a lot of work uh, uh, in terms of the short bowling for us as well and fast bowling. So uh, we, we did a lot of work, and that helped. We've we've done the the great Sri Lanka batters. Let's move on. Um, I've got this and almost in... I think it's almost in the list of the players who made the most runs in the games that you were in. But Sewag comes up next, and, and we know that he loved playing against uh, Sri Lanka. Um, that famous 99, I think he made when someone bowled a no ball, uh, you know, in a one day or at Hanban Tota or wherever it was. That was Dumbo. Um, it was Dumbo. I should have known. I was at the ground, but <laughs> I knew I knew I was traveling around that part of the country. Um, but he but he always seemed to love playing uh, against Sri Lanka, and we and we, uh, we know what a great player of spin he was. You talked before about you know people like Viv and, and Lara and and their uh, you know, the the way that they attacked and the way that they wanted to uh, put pressure on you. Sewag was almost someone different. He almost did it in a, in a like almost in a meditative state. Like the, if the ball was there, he hit it for four. It didn't almost nothing uh, impacted him. What was it like you know watching him from behind the stumps or at slips? Yeah, it was devastating. Was it? I mean, he had the simple mantra in his see ball, hit ball. And to this day, even if you watch him on social media, when a batter is batting out there, that's all he says. That's how you should bat. Just, you know, what are, why are you respecting bowlers so much? And that's exactly the way he pay, played. Forget Sri Lanka, I think. He played, He scored a 190 by T against Australia, I think. Once. MCG. Then debut 100 against South Africa. I mean, mm. again, he never really cared about preserving his wicket. Uh, looking good or being consistent or technical. He was there to score runs. He was there to drive the fear of God into the bowlers. And he did that so well. Uh, even when Ajant the Mendes and Murli were running through India in Mendes's debut series against against them, he scored a double hundred in goal. The only batter, I think, to get into anything beyond 15 or 20 was Sevag. And that was a double hundred when none of the other batters, including Sachin, including Dravid, including Laxman, could score. And he just, he just hit boundaries. He hit boundaries and sixes whenever he could. He had, I think, also kind of a very stubborn thing about getting to 100 with a four or a six. Um, I remember we were playing SSC in a test match in 2009, 10, I think. And then he was on 90-odd. And we actually got Suraj Ramdev on and bowled a top spin and knowing with the field up, knowing he'll charge and telling him expect to charge. So getting past that edge, we can stump him. And it actually did work. One of those rare things when a plan worked because he just he just didn't care. He just wanted to hit that, hit that ball out of the ground. Again, absolute match winner as well. You know, he bats for a session. You're, you're well away in terms of winning a test match. Um, again, incredible player. You know, again, falls into that same category of easy and easy genius. Someone who's a bit different. Actually, just before I go away, did you captain much against Sewak? Is he harder to captain against than a normal player? Because it depends. It, it, he always gives you opportunities to get him out, but. He just had to have fielders in the right place to get him or got to get him early on. I think in India, we had this tour when I was captain into India. We dropped him early twice. That was it. you know. And after that, it was really hard work bringing him back. But he always gave you opportunities. So, um, um, so yeah, it, it, it was interesting captaining, captaining again. him Hard, but very interesting. Uh, Yudis Khan is another player who made a lot of runs against um, Sri Lanka o over the years. A very different kind of player. Um, what what are your memories of him as a batter? What made him special? Again, I think the first time I saw him, I think it was a reserve, and he came and scored. I mean, was it twin hundreds at SSC against Sri Lanka? Well, could be. Yeah. Um, and then he scored a three hundred against us in in Karachi, I think. Um, and in that match, Murli bowled around the wicket. He was out plum LBW when he was like under twenty, and no one appealed. No one appealed. Uh, and Simon Toffel was umpiring. Um, and I saw the replay after the ball had uh, that delivery had finished. And I asked Simon, I said, Simon, how was that? He said, too late for appeal, but that was dead. And then he went on to just absolutely play us. Again, uh, different to the other players, but just, again, very easy on the eye, really great against fast bowling and spin. Sweeping was just amazing. And he took to reverse sweeping as well later on really easily. So 
with spin, we knew he would sweep and sweep and sweep when it got difficult. Um, but again, brilliant to watch. And just scored a lot of runs. Like, you know, again, slightly, perhaps slightly different to even Mohammed Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf was, again, very easy on the eye, standing up tall. Uh, I think Yunus was a lot lower, uh, had a lot more movements in him. But again, fantastic battle. It was was um, Muhammad Yusuf maybe more like a Pakistani version of Mahela? A yes. Bit? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Inzamam was also like that, uh, I think, in that same category as Muhammad Yusuf, you know. Um, they're very different, I mean, from being very large and imposing to having power and not really being too nimble. But just again, he had that, I think he, again, he, he had that same streak of genius in him. I, I wondered if, Yunus Khan wasn't a little bit more like you as a player. It felt like to me, I remember there was a series he turned up in England where he just, clearly his eyesight wasn't what it used to be. And so he was jumping at the short ball and it put England off so much they didn't know how to bowl to him. And I remember there was another series in Australia he turned up and as you said, late in his career, he, he became a reverse sweep. I wonder if Yunus isn't one of those players who was just constantly tinkering, which made, made him harder to line up than other players. Maybe. I haven't really had a lot of cricketing chats with, with Yunus. Um, and 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 maybe uh, I think he he probably was like me, but he had a lot more shots, especially against spin on the sweep and the reverse sweep. Uh, Sacha Tendulkar, you may have heard of him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> obviously, we're going to talk about him quite a lot in the book. But as as a another great batter that you are, how when you look at Sachin Tendulkar, what is it that you saw that other players didn't have? Yeah. <laughs> I think that I, I think he. It, it's not just about what other players didn't have. It's just that, that level of players have a lot of common as well. But he just had this. I mean, uh, technically he was amazing. Uh, he shifted from having a, a like a, a lower stance like Seba with his head almost on the side to a much more upright stance later on. Um, and I mean, you know, naturally just. Amazing against pace, amazing against spin, a very forward thinking in the way he batted, read the game really well, read oppositions really well, could score runs on any pitch, anywhere, at any time. Um, when you say forward thinking, you you mean he realizes what the bowling team wants to do tactically? Yeah, I mean, tactically. Like I've been there as well. You set a field, you, they know exactly what's coming at them, how to adjust to it. That they do, they do certain adjustments. I mean, both of them had this amazing ability of understanding what shots to play. They'll have all the shots in the world, but they might, you know, play an innings until about 80 runs. They'd play only three shots rather than, you know, anything more. Um, uh, one of the few players that could score, you know, all areas of the ground. But I think the greatest thing about Sachin was his passion for the game, his thirst to, to just score runs and his ability to withstand pressure, not just on the field, but outside it. A billion people just constantly chanting his name, wanting him to do very well. I can't believe he lasted as long as he did. What, a 24, 25-year career, 200 tests. And it's a testament to the character, personality, ability, talent of an individual like him. And that makes him complete as, as a cricketer. You know, just complete. He had everything, uh, which included steel and determination and grit. Um, to last and do the things that he did, which was basically constantly being the best in the world, this day after day, mm. with no kind of break any, anywhere. And that's absolutely incredible to be. Um, and yeah, so he was on a, on, a, on a different level in terms of that, of his mental strength, his mental skills, his personality, his character to withstand all of that and still do as well as he did. Amazing. Did I, I know it's a very different situation because Sri Lanka is a lot smaller, but... Did the pressure get to you at times of being the main guy? Our, or, our pressures or, are very different. Uh, I think our crowds are very different. Uh, mm. They love the game and as passionately as Indian fans, but they're Islanders. Uh, they, they look at cricket slightly differently. Um, and, you know, a, a loss is never a world-ending loss. They hurt, they, they get upset, uh, but they always come back. Uh, we don't have that same kind of pressure Indian crowds used to have. I think the Indian crowds now with IPL and all of that is slightly more, uh, slightly different, have have, have, uh, have kind of changed to be a different crowd than they used to be. But in Sri Lanka, it's, um, I, I think it's a great privilege playing for, for the fans that we had in Sri Lanka. They were, they were, they still are 
I mean, so much talk about the team not being as good as it used to be, but you just watched the last three uh, T20s in Dambulla. Tickets sold out, clamoring for tickets, the team doing so well. And the fans just supporting them day after day. That that's that's amazing to see. So it never it, it didn't get us get to us in that same manner. Uh Callis, any thoughts <laughs> on, on Callis? He's pre- he was pretty handy. Again, yeah, you know, you talk about all rounders and it's just I don't know how he did it. Bowling so much and so well, and then batting like he did, changing the way he batted, and just again. Just the volume of runs. It was very workmanlike, almost like a machine. He just went went into his zone. Very powerful, imposing man, like a Matthew Hayden. Um, but you know, just very compact for such a big man. I mean, if you watch his backlift and all of that, it's not as extravagant as a Lara or a or a Hayden or a Sevag. But does he had this this method that he just could reproduce and I think he was mentally very, very, very strong. Growing up in the in the context of a South Africa, of a new South Africa. Um and being again able to do that so well. Um yeah, there are so many times, you know, that that you you look at Kalis and you wonder how how does this guy do it? And again, in any condition, anywhere, batting at the crucial position of number three. He was just incredible to watch. He was just an incredible, incredible person. Compared to some of the other players on this list, and I think it's one reason he doesn't get as much credit as he deserves, is he, he I remember watching him against off spin, and he's one of the first players I saw to get outside off stump and just play everything as if it was off his pads, which county cricketers eventually did years later against fast bowling, right? And every time I saw him, he would have a specific method and he would go with that, and obviously incredible eye and very good footwork and as you said a huge man but he, he felt like he found a, a method against each kind of bowling and then that that was the callous way and it was very hard for him to to shift in the way that some other players could probably uh more so in the limited overs game where again his rhythm of batting was very similar for, throughout his career but the callous way is the way to greatness isn't it i mean how amazing was he? I, I, I don't know whether he doesn't get the same credit, perhaps maybe in the public eye, but I think when cricketers talk to each other, you mention Cullis. It's just, yeah, everyone's in awe. Um, and you speak about him with, with a lot of respect uh, and appreciation for the, the great that he that he was. You mentioned Hayden a lot. Um, what Hayden is a different physical, I mean, him and Cal's are similar, but even Hayden's a different physical specimen again. Uh, then it's hilarious watching him with the other batters on commentary when he's on the commentary because he looks like a fast bowler. Um, how much of Hayden was that you couldn't over pitch and he had this huge advantage of just the ability to whack it past you? Is it, was the was the strength and the muscle that important when, when it came to him? I, I think the strength that he had was was upstairs in the way he viewed himself in the game. I mean, he's a gentle giant. He's just a lovely, lovely human being, just soft as they come off the field. Uh, and even softer now, he's, he's stopped playing. Um, I, he, I think he went through a really tough time. I think I remember someone telling me that they were in Australia, one of the players I played with in Sri Lanka, saying that he was in the gym trying to become an all-rounder because he had not found a way to break into the side. Yeah. And then when he did and he started opening, I mean, with that Langer partnership, I think, again, he thought about, okay, I'm, a, I'm going to impose myself. I'm going to score runs here. I'm going, to, I'm going to show these bowlers who's boss. And he had the game to do it. I mean, even with spin, I think he, he, what we sometimes miss is with the, the brutality of how he batted. We missed how much he thought about the game. With spin, being the ability to sweep and sweep and sweep for an Australian, it's a very un-Australian thing, um, to sweep that well and constantly in India in any condition. I mean, so much so, I think short leg used to wear chest pads. I remember Akash Chopra underneath the helmet, that short leg with this big chest pad. Because that was how powerful and intimidating he was. Um, um, it's... Um, he, he he really prided himself on anticipating what bowlers were trying to do. I've had a few chats with him since he's been on commentary, and it's really fascinating to understand how much he thought about uh, getting to staying one step ahead of the opposition and he thought about the game. Um, so you miss all of those nuances and subtleties when you just look at Hayden taking a big stride down and hitting you 
back over the head at 150 miles per hour or counting Shoaib down saying, okay, that's one, you know, 15 to go and you're spent, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, again, um, I had him, I think I had Hados in my all time test 11 as well, I think, but yeah, it's just incredible. Well, someone I'm pretty sure will definitely be in your test 11. Let's finish off here. You said you wanted to bat like Brian Lara. <laughs> you, you were pretty good yourself. What was it about Brian Lara that you were like, is it, is it a prettiness? Was it the, the, the impact he had on games? What was it that you wanted to, to be like Brian Lara? He just said everything except perhaps the thirst to be consistent. I think that never bothered him. I don't think he, I think he just wanted to win games. And whenever there was a challenge thrown at him, he just had that ability to just step up and take take you down. Um, I watched him score 680 runs in three tests against us in Sri Lanka with Murali, Vasi, all of them in top form. And a series where him having scored 680 runs by himself, the West Indies lost 3-0. And he did he did all of that on less than, I think, three hours or four hours of sleep a night. Uh, he, it, it's hard to describe his level of genius. Um, you know, again, I always have comparisons to Aravinda because I don't think the volume of runs ever bothered them. Maybe it may have, but it just didn't, I don't think it allowed, they allowed to, it to get there kind of that, how would you say, it, that, that the spirit down, dampened the way they played. And every time I watch Branham, I used to love Sir Vivian, which I still do, uh, both as a cricketer and both as a, a, as a human being. But Brian Lara as a cricketer is just, I mean, you watch him and you're very, you, you feel grateful to have watched him score runs against you. That's how good he is, you know. Um, and that's quite intimidating to have. Um, he's a small made man, he has a swagger on the field, but a very, you know, not not as much uh, about him off the field in terms of that, in terms of the swagger. But, I mean, I challenge you to find any anyone that had watched Brian scoring runs and walked away without being completely overwhelmed as to how brilliant that man was. I mean, his backlift. Every coach in the world will tell you, never do that. Right, never do that. Never have that flourish. Never have that height. But just incredible. Um, and, and his career, the the, the 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 runs he scores, you know, the five hundred and one, you know, the four hundred, the three seven five, whatever he does, he does he does it in, in 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 you know, when he makes a statement, it is world global headlines. Um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, 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 he. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I can't. I don't think I can describe him or break his his cricket down. Uh, I think again, great cricket brain, very very determined, mentally very strong. I think, uh, yeah, he was special. Um, just on your career, and then and then I'll let you go. But uh, your father came out towards the end of your career saying that if you'd listened to him more, you would have averaged over sixty. And we all had a lot of fun with that on Twitter that day, if I remember correctly. One of the great days of cricket Twitter. Okay. Um, do you have any regrets? Is there anything, because I feel like you got so much out of your batting and you improved and you moved forward and everything. Is there anything that you look back, maybe even now with watching Basball and, you know, Travis Head and, you know, all the, and Jaiswell and all the, is there anything you look back and you go, oh, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd been there. Yeah, of course, quite a lot. Uh, but, you know, those regrets are part of, part of any career, any life. And as long as you're settled with it and, and 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 you're you're content having those regrets as well. Uh, highs, lows, everything that came with with, uh, with the career I had, I'm, I'm I'm pretty happy. So yes, regrets, of course, um, but I'm, I'm 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 pretty content. I understand that you're content, but if you came through this generation, what do you think you would have been? Slightly, is there anything that would have been slightly different about your batting? Do you yeah, think? probably. You know, batted with a lot more freedom. Um understood the value of entertainment in the sport as well and in the way we played. Um, and in any format, test or T20 or T10 or one day, it didn't matter, I think. To have that real entertainment factor come through in the way we played and, 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 and how we chased wins. Uh, perhaps all, all of that, uh, you know, I think times have changed and 
and players play with with a lot more abandon, a lot more uh, freedom due to you know the advent of T20 and its effects are round on every format, and that's great to see. And the fans are enjoying cricket more and more. Um, so yeah, there's a lots of things that probably would have changed, but unfortunately, my time is done. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Jared. Thank you very much. Been a pleasure. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today. <laughs> <laughs>